I'm super excited to be here today because this is actually the first time that I'm giving a live talk at an in-person conference. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I thought I want to take a quick photo just to remember this um, forever. That's all right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, anyway, my name is Dominic. I'm a software engineer from Vienna, where I work as a front-end tech lead at Adverity. Uh, you can find me online as TK Dodo almost everywhere. And for the last three and a half years, I've maintained the quite popular open source library React Query. Uh, sorry, TanStack React Query, as we, as we call it these days. Uh, quick question, please raise your hands if you've heard about that library before. Yeah, wow, OK, that's a lot of hands. <laughs> Uh, that's great because it means uh, you might actually know some of the APIs I'm going to talk about today. Um, because you know, today I want to walk you through some of the API design decisions that we've made in React Query over the last couple of years. Um, tell some stories about things that went well, but also highlight some of the trade-offs that we had to make. And you know, there were some mistakes that we made. And yeah, maybe there are some lessons that we can all learn from those. And I want to talk about uh, that mainly for two reasons. Uh, one, I think API design is hard. Um, if you don't believe me, that's not my quote. Julius said that. He's a really smart guy. He maintains TRPC. He also contributes uh, to React Query from time to time. So if he says it, it's probably right. And the second reason is I think React Query has a really, really sweet API. And uh, it's one of the reasons why it has become so successful over the last couple of years. Now, of course, I can't take uh, credit for that. Uh, Tanner Lindsley made the library, and he designed most of the APIs. And he actually has a very good tweet uh, summarizing the goals of the library, where he says that uh, the query API is actually medium-sized when you unpack it all. But the most important part is that you can understand and learn how to use it by starting with a single function that provides 80% of the entire value proposition first try. From there, the rest of its API can be gradually learned if needed. And I think. That's what it takes for a library to become popular. It needs to be both minimal and intuitive, as well as powerful and flexible. But for any given API, you know, those two things are usually on the opposite sides of the same scale. If we take a look at array methods, for example, on the left-hand side, we would have something like array.join, right? a very simple method. It does one thing and does it very well, and there's no surprises there. And on the other end of the spectrum, we would have something like array.reduce, which is very powerful. Um, we can implement all other array methods just with reduce. Um, but you know, if this is the only thing we have available, it would probably also not be great, because it's also quite complicated to read from time to time. Now, for libraries, uh, I think the second scale is missing, and that it should usually be application complexity. Because as your app complexity grows, you actually want your APIs to become more powerful and flexible. And on that scale, I would put use query right about here, bottom left, if we call it with the minimal required arguments, which is basically just a query key and a query function. Now, that API, I think, is still quite simple and easy to use, but it gives us a lot of things already out of the box. We get things like caching, requested duplication, uh, background updates, you know, automatic garbage collection. Like The list goes on and on. There's a lot of things that we get from just this one function call. And then later on, we might add a use mutation call right, to uh, make an update and then link it back with invalidate queries. Um, so this is already a little bit more involved, but you know, we can get really far with just those two functions. So I put that right about here. But as time goes on and your application becomes more complex, you might want to do more things. So you're going to make an optimistic update maybe from time to time, or you need an infinite query. And those APIs are certainly a bit more complex. Um, and all the way up, we have, like, uh, for example, our plugins or the uh, cache subscriptions, which are really, really low level. For example, our dev tools are built with the cache subscriptions. But you know, once you get to a point where you need this complexity, you're probably happy that those exist as well, just like you are about using reduce from time to time. OK, and we got to this API that kind of evolves with you uh, through careful planning, lots of iteration, and also a couple of major versions. Um, and that gets me right to the first learning that I had as an open source maintainer, which is I'm no longer excited uh, about major versions. And I think uh, you probably shouldn't be either. Um, API design is hard. I think I said that already. Um, but it's especially hard in open source because we can't easily revert the decisions that we've taken. 
Um, as a different example, at work, at Verity, we have a design system that we publish to a private NPM uh, registry. And um, you know, the latest version that this is on is actually 105.2.0, right? So those are, those are huge numbers. Um, but you know, nobody cares because it's just a number going up. Um, most teams would just upgrade and you know, see that nothing really changed that affected them or it was just like a default value that changed. Um, and they just move on with it. So it's, it's just not a big deal. But in open source, we can't do those breaking changes lightly because every new major version has to really be this kind of like marketing event where we have announcement tweets and announcement blog posts and even videos. Because if the users hear like major version, you major, I think it's, it sounds huge and great. And uh, the question that always comes then is like, what are the new features in this major version? Um, the problem about that is that uh, major versions aren't about features. They're about breaking existing things and features usually go in minors. So if we remember React hooks, right? They came in version 16.8, not, not 16 or, or 17, but specifically 16.8. And uh, React Router added route loaders in, in version 6.4 and Bun added Windows support in version 1.1. So those are just some examples where features usually uh, go in minors. Of course, there are exceptions uh, where you redesign something from the ground up you know, and that enables you to do new features. You might have new features in a major version, but usually they come in minors. So when I got asked what are the new features in React Query version 5, I actually started to sweat a little bit because, you know, we didn't have anything planned. We were planning on breaking like how you call use query and basically everything, um, but we didn't have any new features planned. So what we did was we added some features to version 5 that we could have honestly also backported to version 4. And I don't think that's great because it means we're withholding features uh, to the users just to have this kind of like marketing event or great new version. Um, and I think uh, what would be good is would, to, would be to kind of like decouple these breaking changes from the marketing events. Um, I think Anthony Fu had a great suggestion about uh, the four digit semantic versioning where you would have an epoch number in front of the major version that you could use for those overhauls and for marketing and we could do breaking changes uh, then more often. I think it's a nice idea. Um, I doubt it will, it will happen anytime soon. It's just something to think about. And yeah, maybe when a new major version comes out, in, instead of asking what's new, maybe ask uh, what is breaking uh, in the library instead. Okay, so I'm no longer excited about major versions, but one thing I'm still excited about is TypeScript. Um, yeah, you too? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, don't worry, we're not gonna go into library level TypeScript in, in, in this talk. Um, but I think um, if you're building something new, um, when you're starting out, right, I think it helps tremendously to think about the types from the beginning and design your APIs with types in mind. Now, I know there are lots of people who say, well, we can just make it work first and we can always add the types later. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing to do because when we're working with JavaScript, we can have all those cute and dynamic constructs um, that work at runtime, but that might be quite hard to type later on. Um, I think everything is doable with enough magic in TypeScript, but you know, all magic comes with a price. And in this case, the price is usually uh, application compl type complexity and, and maintenance burden. Um, I really like this quote, uh, not sure who said it. If something is hard for a compiler to figure out, it's also hard for humans to understand. So if we're having troubles to express what we want to the compiler, you know, maybe the API that we've chosen isn't really the best. And one of those cute and dynamic constructs we had in the React Query was actually use query because when we started out, you know, you could call it in three different ways with three different positional arguments. Now, there's not really a good way to make this work in TypeScript except with overloads, which, which is what we did. And overloads are problematic because they have like very weird over, uh, very weird error messages from time to time. Because what the compiler does is it tries all different versions and then it displays the error message for the last overload that it tried, and that might be completely misleading. Also, we had to do some runtime checks to actually you know, transform what the user inputs into a single object anyway. And we thought like really who needs three different ways to, to do the same thing. Um, so what we did was we, uh, in version five, we removed all the other uh, options to do it. Now you can just call use query with the options object. And uh, that reduced the num uh, lines of types that we had uh, from 125 to just 25 lines of types. So great simplification for us as well and a better uh, developer experience. And the thing is, I think had we started with types uh, from the beginning, I think this is the API uh, that we would uh, come up with eventually. Okay, 
Now, enough about TypeScript. Uh, one thing that comes up uh, when the library gets popular uh, every time is that users want more features, right? And to be honest, I think managing a demanding user base is one of the more tricky things in open source because on the one hand, you really want to implement the features that users are suggesting um, and to listen to their problems and help them, help them fix them. But on the other hand, the more we add to the library, like if you just add every feature request that, that comes in, the API becomes bloated and the library becomes unfocused. And you know, that, that might reduce adoption again for newcomers because they kind of get confused about what's actually going on. We have to, we have to balance this somehow. Um, my advice here would be to just take your time before you add anything to a library. I think users can be very demanding sometimes, but um, you know, in the relationship between um, user and maintainer, it is actually the user's job to tell you all about the, the deadlines and the use cases and how important it is that you add this feature. But it's the maintainer's job to keep the bigger picture in mind. Like, will this API also work for other users, for other cases uh, that the original reporter hasn't even thought about? Because remember, once we add an API, we can't really like, change it easily without a new major version. Now, one of these things where, where I got this wrong was the refetch page API on our infinite queries. Um, for context, infinite queries are our way to make these doom scrolling pages that everyone hates relatively easy to implement. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but you know, technically, an infinite query is just one cache entry that is chunked up into multiple pages where each page depends upon the previous one. And that has the effect that when a refetch happens, you know, we refetch all the pages one after the other. And some users, you know, complained that they wanted just give me a method where I can refetch like a single page uh, from, this, uh, from this, these pages. And we thought, OK, cool app, that's not, that's not a bad idea. Sounds reasonable. So we're going to add uh, to email that queries an option to refetch um, like a single page. That sounded good at first, but it actually had, had three problems. This, uh, we found that out over time. For one, I think it's a bit weird and confusing because invalidated queries doesn't actually know anything about infinite or normal queries. So if you don't match an infinite query, this function actually does nothing. And for technical constraints, we could also only add it to the imperative versions that we had. Um, and if there was an automatic refetch, it would still al always refetch all the pages. And I think it's also one of the easiest ways to get like incorrect state on your screen. Because if you have a list of pages that depend on each other, and you refetch one in the middle, you know, you might see duplicate results on the screen if someone else made an update to like the first page or something. So your UI can, you, the UI can get like out of sync uh, really easily. So what we did was we took a step back and asked the users like, what's the actual use case that you're wanting to uh, use this for? What's the motivation behind this? And it was always the same. They said that like, if I have 100 pages in the cache and the user scrolls down a lot, I don't want to spam my API server with a refetch. And I, I think that's fair. Um, but we tried to solve this problem from a different perspective instead. And eventually, we settled on the uh, much easier max pages uh, option on infinite query, uh, which simply allows you to limit how many pages are in the cache at any given time. And I think this API is a lot better because it solves the problem holistically, but from a different uh, point of view for all kinds of refetches. And it coincidentally can also speed up your rendering if you are navigating to a page that already has cached pages. Um, it will render faster because it doesn't need to render as much. So my takeaway here is that, that we landed on a not so good uh, API decision too quickly. And had we given ourselves more time, um, I think we would come up with a, a better solution instead. The only other alternative uh, I can think of is uh, prefixing everything with unstable or experimental until you know it's going to last. Um, I don't know if that's better because I don't know if people actually use experimental APIs. And then, yeah, I get messages like this, and I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's really better. Another, um, another API that gets requested often is uh, to be able to debounce API calls. So we, uh, we get that feature request a lot. And you might want to uh, have that when you, for example, have a search field and you want to do auto filtering. Unless you want to like, make an API request on every keystroke, you want some way of debouncing that. So the suggestion is just add a debounce number field to use query, right? But this is a very good example of uh, an API that will not make it into React Query because it's just not the responsibility of, of React Query. There are a lot of different ways to do debouncing and to do it correctly. Um, it likely needs more than just a number as an option, right? So it can get complicated quite fast. And it will also uh, increase the bundle size uh, for users that, that don't use this. The good news here is that you can relatively easily implement this in userland. You can use your favorite use debounce implementation. You can write one yourself or you can just use deferred value from React. 
the way this works is that the filter in your state will be used for displaying the current input to the user, but you will take the debounced filter and pass it to the query key and then to React Query to not make fetches that often. I think this inversion of control is a great way to give users the flexibility to implement uh, certain features on their own and allows us to keep a small API surface. Now, I think the query key is quite special here, but we can also get inversion of control on other options that we have by just making them a function. Uh, one example is a discussion I had with a user uh, a while back uh, where they felt that the refetch on window focus uh, feature that we have that's turned on per default is great for most cases, but you know sometimes it's not. For example, when the query is in an error state. Now, we can't really add another option um, to that because that would be like, what is that, refetch on window focus if error or something. It's kind of like, uh, that's just weird. Um, so what we did was instead we just made this function uh, a, a callback function that accepts the query where the user can derive what they want from that in user land. Um, I think that's uh, like a cheap trick to allow users to do that. And we've since made almost all of our options except callback functions um, so that you have more flexibility. Uh, now, um, lastly, I think even if we keep uh, all of these points in mind, and no matter how well we try to design an API, I think you know, there will come a time when, when some people will be unhappy with it. And um, those people can be uh, quite loud about it. And I think uh, open source maintainers are not immune to making mistakes. So the chances are that at one point we might release an API that, that isn't very well received. Um, I learned this lesson the hard way with React Query version 4, where we made some changes to our primary state machine. Uh, let's take a look at the example from before where we have this uh, filter and uh, what happens when we try to handle the, the loading and error states uh, with the derived is loading and, and is error uh, flags. Now this, this code worked perfectly fine in version 3, but what happened in version 4 was that you would see uh, like a loading spinner for all eternity. Um, and that's because uh, a query that starts out in a disabled state, because here we have the filter as an empty string default, so enabled is going to be false, so the query is going to be disabled. In version 4, this would also put it into the is loading state. Now, of course, there are reasons for this, and it didn't sound as bad when we made these changes and implemented this API. But if we take a step back and objectively look at it, I mean, if we have no knowledge about React Query, I think you know this behavior is just a very bad API. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Um, there are no, no excuses for that. And it turns out a lot of people uh, feel the same way. Um, yeah, and, and I agree that th this is messed up. Um, and this uh, thumbs up counter is still going up, by the way, every day, uh, even though we've, uh, we've, we've already released a fix in, uh, in, in, in version 5. Um, and the thing is that, that, that this feedback would actually have been very good like a couple of days earlier, because we got this right after the, the major release. So. Um, yeah, what stuck with me is, is the user expectation that maintainers get everything right in their API designs, while at the same time, you know, they might not try out uh, uh, beta versions and report feedback. So if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from, from this talk, it's actually this. Um, please help out maintainers of open source libraries that you're using. Yeah, there, there are the other maintainers. <laughs> uh, so please help out uh, maintainers of the libraries that you're using by trying out beta versions or release candidates and reported feedback because I think it's the best time to be heard. Without those early feedback, you know, mistakes like the one that I made might make it into the stable release. But you know, stable doesn't mean bug free or, or battle tested. It, it just means that we can't change the API anymore um, without a new major version. So open source uh, is a two way street and I think this is one of the best ways uh, to help while also getting the most in return. Yeah, that's all I got. Uh, thank you very much.